Hello everybody and welcome back to I was a teenage exocologist. Eh, I don't even know what to say. I'm still so everything is so horrible. Everything happened so fast last time. I wasn't fast enough. I didn't have enough strength for anything. My mom is dead. Calm is dead. So many people are dead. It's awful. I don't even know what we're gonna do now. Oh my god. It's horrible. I guess I'll just talk to people first. Mars crosses her arms and sulks. What's the point of having all these kudos if I can't actually use them to, like, buy stuff we need? Like, hello, it's not like I can mail order some supplies through the wormhole. Oh no, is the nano printer gone? Oh, probably. Tangent frowns. I just don't understand, she says. Why now? Why does it keep getting worse? I don't even know anymore. It's hard to talk to your dad about everything. Losing your mom, then losing your colony right after. It's too much to take. Neither of you know what to say. Is there even anything to say? Where's Anemone? I know it's hard, Cal says, fiddling nervously with the tassel on his shirt. But I just think, what would your mom do right now? She wouldn't complain, that's for sure. Yeah, well, she's fucking dead. <laughs> no, I'm so sorry. It's just so overwhelming. Deese is examining a bit of rubble, turning it over in his hands. I wonder if we're gonna fund, like, alien tech, he says. Wouldn't that be cool? That would be cool, Deese. Oh, you can't even go this way now. What do we do? Oh, everything is so destroyed. What is there even to do? I, I, this is the only building right now. Engineering is crammed with families and what belongings they've salvaged from destroyed living quarters. You could spend your time in crowded temporary lodgings in the classroom or help the adults try to fix things. Let's rebuild. The faster we get it done, the faster we can fucking figure out what the hell's going on. My toughness is awful! The first month of quiet passes, each day plodding one after the other. You still have trouble sleeping in the classroom barracks, but there's nowhere else to go. Every day you wake up with the others and try to make the best of it. Grief and anger come in waves, not just for you, but for everyone. Some days are better than others. You're assigned to help rebuild the walls. The first part of the month is spent just dragging away the wreckage, sorting it into salvage or recycling. By the time that's done, crew disassembling the parts of the stratospheric have delivered enough salvage that you can begin patching the walls. A sense of urgency permeates the crew. Ef after everything, people need to feel safe. Deese is working with the crew with you, something he does begrudgingly. Walls didn't help the first time, he grumbles, whenever anyone asks for his opinion. We should just tear them all down and look, live like animals do. If someone planted a building on my land, I'd be pissed off too. I mean, he does make- he's- he's right! The walls haven't helped at all, they've gotten in every time! You don't go so far as to sabotage the walls, but you certainly don't contribute. You and Deese drag your feet, sulking any time tr someone tells you to work harder. Surprisingly, you don't get in trouble. You're just kids, after all. No one expects you to get back to work right away after a huge trauma like losing your home. Was this ever really our home? We've been attacked every year. There we go. <laughs> I don't even know what to say, honestly. It's also overwhelming. Oh, it's my birthday. Oh, wonderful. And my mom's dead. <laughs> this is all great. The sun finally dawns again on your birthday. You wake up early and climb to the top of engineering to watch the sun's first watery rays break the horizon as the wormhole recedes across the sky. Dawn should represent hope after a long period of darkness, but this light only reveals the full extent of the damage to the colony. You've been having trouble sleeping, like most people. It's hard to rest crammed into the classrooms with all the other kids and their families, and every time you close your eyes, you see. You shake your head to clear the memories. You pull your blanket more tightly around your shoulders. Not your blanket. The one that- that one's gone. And you stare out as the sun rises on the horizon, meager and sickly. Hey, kiddo, you hear, and then your dad comes and sits down beside you. I was looking for you. Nice view, huh? At least we got a rooftop patio out of the deal. He laughs a little at his own joke, and then just sort of- trails off with a sigh afterwards. He puts his arm around your shoulders, and you sit in silence for a while, watching the sunrise pick out all the broken glass littering the fields, glimmering like a field of stars. Neither of you really know what to say. 
It's clear your dad feels like he has to give you a pep talk, but there's an oppressive nature to the silence that makes it feel impossible for either of you to start. Eventually, he just sighs, and his shoulders slump. I know things seem pretty bad right now, he says, squinting into the sunrise. It sounds like it's taking all his effort not to cry, but it'll get better. It has to, right? You're not so sure. At least your mom wasn't here to see this, he mutters. That's a silver lining, I guess. You watch the sunrise together for a few more minutes. After a bit, your dad musters up a brave smile and pulls out a little box tied with a piece of gardening twine. Happy birthday, my little rutabaga, he says. You know what it is before you open it. Your old medallion, the one your dad made with the sun on it to represent Earth. It was broken during the attack and all the chaos you didn't even notice. But your dad did, and he made you a new one. It's just like you remembered. A similar design with a wormhole this time to represent Vertumna. You thank him and squint it out at the squirreling wormhole still barely visible in the brightening sky. It's so massive and awe-inspiring this time of year, but it always seems to herald disaster. You're happy to watch it fade away into the daylight. Your dad slaps you on the back. What a birthday, huh? Here's hoping they all get better from here. Can anything be better right now? Please, I'm so sad. You both head back downstairs to the wreckage of the canteen, where they've put up temporary roofing with whatever tarps and scraps could be found. The colony nanoprinters, the few that still run, have been working day and night to replace the necessities of life, but larger construction progress pr projects are going to take some time. Aunt Anne has coaxed the kitchen nanoprinters to making soy gruel and press bar. Life-sustaining, but depressing. You and the other colonists eat your breakfast in stony silence as you mentally prepare for the day. Chief Administrator Seek has taken over as interim governor until the council can elect someone new. Last week, they held a mass funeral for everyone who died. There's talk of turning the stratospheric's destroyed front half into a memorial shrine after everything useful has been salvaged. There's still so much to do. Oh. This sucks. This sucks. <laughs> I'm so sad. I want out of here. I really, I want to leave. I don't want to be in here anymore. I want to get out of here. I don't want to hang out with anyone. I just want to run away. <laughs> How do I get out? Oh, wait. My gear. Plus five animals. Hmm. Plus five to challenges. That could be good. We'll use that one for a while. I mean, I do need more animals, but if we need that, we can bring it up. Hopefully. I mean, I still do have pretty good animals. But I definitely could do with more animals. Alright, back to the grind. We can mourn or we can- let's keep rebuilding, we need to. You're assigned to help out in geophonics. The agriculturists have been hard at work trying to salvage what they can of the ruined fields and the destroyed greenhouses, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Your dad has taken over as chief cultivator. Succeeding your mom was already difficult for him, and now there's this. He's never been the kind of guy to hide from hard work, but he's been pretty distant lately. Cal's working in Geophonics too, of course. He smiles when he sees you. Hey, Abby, there's a lot of stuff to do. What do you want to work on? I'll rebuild the animal pens. The pens only suffered minor damage during the attack. Weirdly, most of the damage seems to have come from inside the pens, as if the normally tame animals have been stirred into a frenzy. Tangen is also here, though it's not to help hammer or nail things. She's studying the animals, trying to figure out what could have influenced them. She takes blood and hair samples and readings from some sort of complicated brain scanning device. Interesting, is all she says, not explaining her findings to you or Cal. Everyone is worried this will be the final nail in the coffin for your food supply after the famine last year. You try not to think about it too hard, instead focusing on just doing what you can to help rebuild. Ah! <laughs> Oh my god, do I need to freaking go run off and try and find some... I need to find some food. But I want to explore the plains. I mean, I just really want to get... You're eating in the mess tents when you hear something rumbling. Your bowl and cutlery start rattling. People look around in alarm. Could it be another attack so soon? You begin to hear shouting from outside. Someone runs into the tent. There's something falling from the sky, they shout. It's on fire! You join the crowd of people leaving your temporary structures to gather in the colony square. People are squinting up into the milky, quiet sunlight, pointing and gesturing wildly. It's impossible to miss the thing hurtling towards you from space, like a great big ball of fire coming straight for you. Is this it? Is this the end? After all you've been through, a meteor is going to land in the middle of your already ruined colony and kill you all? It's a ship! 
It's another ship! Mars grabs your shoulder. It's another ship, she exclaims. Look, look, it's another spaceship from Earth! Excitement ripples through the crowd. Could it be? Oh my god! <laughs> you stare up unbelievingly at the rapidly approaching ship. The flames of its entry into the atmosphere dissipate, but a thick column of greasy black smoke trails behind it. Soon you can hear the whistle of it rippling through the atmosphere at terminal velocity. That is not a controlled descent! It's an enormous ship coming at you way too fast! The ship's reverse thrusters fire, trying to slow it down so it doesn't smash into a billion pieces when it hits the planet. Everyone scatters to take cover. You crouch behind some rocks, throw your arms over your head, and squeeze your eyes shut! You hear the massive spaceship touch down in geophonics, plowing through the fields. Oh my fucking god! The poor fields! And grinding over what was left of the greenhouses, you're thrown to the ground from the force of the impact as shrapnel and small rocks zing past your head. It grinds along like some roaring monster, cutting a great scar through the colony and kicking up an enormous cloud of dust. Finally, the ship comes to a creaking, shuddering halt. You and the other colonists carefully crawl out of your hiding places, coughing and rubbing your eyes. The new ship is half buried and obscured by dust, but you can tell it's from Earth. You squint to make out stenciled letters. Heliopause. A hatch opens in its side, and its silhouettes begin to emerge. Silhouettes with guns! Soldiers march out of the dust and quickly surround all the remaining colonists. More soldiers form two parallel lines from the ship to the square. Their guns in the parade rest, and a lone figure strides to the center towards you. Greetings, fugitives from Earth, the man said, spreading his hands wide. Who the fuck are you? A dismayed murmur ripples through the crowd. The adults exchange significant looks. Chief Engineer Instance tries to slip out of the crowd, but she's stopped by the line of soldiers. The man smiles. He has a broad, easygoing smile that doesn't match the threatening aura of the soldiers, nor the smoking ruin of the ship behind him. I am Commander Lum, he says proudly. As captain of the Heliopause, I have come to render aid and bring you to justice. Get the fuck out of here! The Heliopause soldiers have the colonists surrounded and shove you gently but forcefully back into the crowd. Oh, fine, I'll listen. Seek steps forward out of the crowd. You're not the commander of the Heliopause, they say firmly. Governor Utakot was expecting Governor Morikawa. Everyone is surprised. Utakot had been in communication with the ship? For how long? Why didn't anyone tell us anything? I am captain of the Heliopause, Lum repeats stubbornly, then adds, according to the chain of command. We, uh, sustained significant loss of personnel when we went through the wormhole. Or did you kill them? I don't trust you. You can't help but notice many of the soldiers exchanged looks this time. You wonder how many people had to die before Lum became commander. As the commanding officer, Lum continues, I declare that this colony to be under our protection. As such, you are all now subject to the laws of Earth. Seek bows. N now, now, they stammer. There's no need for dramatics. We are a diminished colony, as you see. Governor Uticott died in the most recent attack, and Fluorescent passed away a few months ago. Even technician Halitosis is gone. Y you see, we're quite leaderless. Wait, your mom? What would these Earth cops have wanted from your mom? Oh no, what, what happened on Earth? You notice Chief Engineer Instance is being held with her arms behind her back. She glowers at Lum with unbridled hatred. Lum turns to the assembled colonists. Well, why don't we fix that, he declares. Say hello to your new governor. You hear a few gasps of shock and outrage, and Lum raises his hand placatingly. Let's not pretend you don't need our help, he says, and we could simply arrest you instead, but there's no need to demoralize your little colony further. Judging from the number of guns on display, you don't think you have a choice in this. No one knew how to react. A new governor from Earth? Nearly a hundred new colonists, most of them trained soldiers? What does this mean for the colony? Nothing good! The crowd disperses slowly and the council members follow Lum back to the Heliopause, presumably to talk about the future of the colony. You hope? You track down your friends. This is not good, guys! Oh! I'm so sorry, them! So, what do you think about these new people? Mars asks. I don't want to share this planet. I, I, that sounds so mean, but I don't trust them! I don't want to share this planet. I don't mind sharing, Cal chimes in, but we don't have anything left to share. We were already barely hanging on, and did you see what they did to the fields? Well, all torn up and even worse now. The entire colony, now twice as many of you, set to work on salvaging the wreckage of the heliopause, tearing it down and combining it with the stratospheric's remaining engine section. Spirits are high, though these new colonists from the heliopause aren't like any people you've met before. With their uniforms and weapons, they're more like an invading force than a rescue. You aren't sure what this means for the colony, or for your future. I hate everything that's happening right now! Everything has changed so fast! Ooh. As the dust settles, you rebuild your colony around the new ship, the Kiliopause. 
The new arrivals, soldiers mainly, are aloof at first. Many see you as fugitives. How am I a fugitive? I was born in fucking space! Together you build new walls, living quarters, greenhouses, and a massive bunker garrison. The Shadows Engineering Wing is the only reminder of your old colony. The Heliopause brought enough rations for another five years, as well as rich seed bank and working hydroponics. Finally, an end to the slow starvation you felt for years. They also have more guns and explosives than you've ever seen in your life. Even the ship has guns. A full stomach, a roof over your heads, the promise of safety convinces most of the shadow colon colonists to accept the Helios. I don't trust it! In turn, the Helios decide that you criminals pose little threat. A grudging peace is brokered between the two groups. You decide they aren't so different, really. They're even Helio children, born among the stars, just like you. Oh, uh, really? Oh! I like our new house! After a month of hard work, you and your dad move into your new quarters, and you have your own bedroom for the first time in your life. You place a picture of your mother on the shelves beside the bed. You step out onto your balcony to watch the new colony, its grounds bustling with so many strangers and strange new ideas. You feel something rising into your chest that you haven't felt in some time. Hope. Excitement. What will the new day bring? You better get out and find out. I'm gonna cautiously step outside because I'm nervous. How things changed. Whoa, those are big walls. Oh no, wait, that's the Helio. Oh, we have new people. Wait, but there's still people. Oh my, oh my god, this is huge. Goodness gracious. This place is huge! Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness! What do I do first? There's so- who are you? There's a lot of people to talk to. Ooh, I'll take that. I mean, I guess it wasn't the worst thing to happen, but I mean, I liked our little colony. Things changed so suddenly. Hang on, I'll take that log. All right, who should we talk to first? I want to talk to the new people. Actually, hang on, my dad wanted to talk to me too. What's up, Pops? Even though it hurts, you find yourself wandering over to Geophonics. It feels not good to be here in the place your mom loved and ultimately gave her life to, but not not good either. It feels like when you have a bruise and you can't stop yourself from pushing on it because the pain reminds you the injury is real. Like your mom dying is this huge invisible wound, and poking at it forces you to feel something instead of just like, being numb. Your dad is taking time off work. Your parents work double and triple shifts during the growing season this year, and now that it's over, it just feels so cruel. When people work hard, they should be able to look back on what they did and feel proud. Instead, there's just this huge gap where your mom should be. You find your dad sitting in your mom's personal garden. It's miraculously starting to grow again, despite being trampled flat during the last attack and neglected during the famine before that. Still, various vertumnin flowers are starting to sprout, as well as hardier earth ones like dandelions. Your dad looks up and musters a smile. He pats the bench beside him. I'm gonna sit quietly. Your dad is good at sitting in silence. He holds your hand and you sit together, watching the bugs flit around the garden. Eventually, he starts to hum quietly. You recognize the song, an old favorite of theirs. One they used to play after dinner when they would sit and talk for hours about the future they envisioned on Bertumna. You remember sitting at their feet and playing with your blocks, letting the weird adult words wash over you. They had so many plans. You think about your mom and how much she sacrificed for futures you'll never see. Your dad puts an arm around your shoulders, and you sit like that for a long, long while. Oh. Oh, you want to talk to me again? Like every pollen Oh, fuck, I forgot about that. No! Please, no! <laughs> Like every pollen season, your dad gets the shimmer. The pollen is bad this year. Thick, heavy clouds of pink. Even your eyes are a little itchy, and your dad's not the only colonist spending the week in bed. You can hear other people sneezing as you walk through the quarters, bringing him hop trippet soup. Thanks, kiddo, your dad rasps. At least he's sitting up in bed now. Your mom never got sick. Not ever, your dad reminisces. Not sure she missed a day of work from the day we landed until the day she... He stops and sighs. I miss your mom. I wish Instance would find a cure already, he grumbles, his hand shaking as he lifts his spoon. Three years and all she can suggest is bed rest and fluids. What good is all her researching if it can't fix my headache? Your dad must be feeling really sick. He never complains about this stuff. You check his temperature with your hollow palm, and then dim the lights and bring him a cold pack for his forehead. He has a crust of glittery pink gunk around his lips, looking cracked and gross, so you wipe it away. The glitter is just everywhere on him, like it's coming right out of his pores. He looks iridescent in the murky light flittering through the pollen outside. 
Hey, do you mind opening the widow window a little for some fresh air? It smells like a sick person in here, he grumbles, pushing away his soup and rolling over in bed. Oh, this is the, this is the turning point, isn't it? it? I'm not, I can't. I'm thinking about the pollen thing I saw and like how all the creatures died. I don't think opening the window is a good idea. I'm sorry, Dad. The pollen might be in everywhere already, but there's no sense in making it worse. You pretend to crack the window for him, and by the time you look over, he's asleep again. The worst of the pollen fog subsides in a few days, and your dad starts to look a little better. He gets back to work, which is good because there's a lot to do in order to rebuild the colony and get the Heliopause's hydrophonics up and running. You're still sweeping glittering dust out of your quarters a weeks later. The stuff gets everywhere. I feel like he could have died right there if I was not careful. Alright, what else have we got? Dece, you doing okay? Maybe we deserved it, Dece mutters. The new ship didn't save us. It just delayed the inevitable. When their food and weapons run out, we'll be back where we started. Didn't they learn anything? People never do, Dece. History tends to repeat itself. Ooh, log. Alright, let's talk to the new people and then we're getting the fuck out of here. I want to be away from the colony for a while. The colony is full of new people. Everywhere you look, you see a stranger. It's disorienting. After growing up in a closed spaceship, you never expected to meet any other humans that weren't made here on Vertumna. You bump straight into one of these new people while you're jogging through the colony. Oof! He laughs and holds you steady, brushing the imaginary dust off you and giving you a wide, fanged smile. Hey, it's one of the new kids from the Heliopause. You think his name is Rex? Hey, what's up? You play it cool. You give him a little nod. You notice his, he's wiggling his dog ears. They can really move independently. Pleased to meet you, he says. I'm Rex. Rex puts his hand against his cheek, looking cute and a little lost. Hey, uh, since I'm new here, do you think you could help me find the construction yard? I thought I might apply for a job there. <laughs> okay, I can flirt with him already. I'll take you there. You walk him over to command. Everything's moved around since the Heliopause landed, but the construction yard is still in command where it always was. At the entrance, you meet Mars, filing her nails and looking like she's waiting for somebody. Why, hello, cutie, she says to Rex. Where did you come from? He looks her up and down and grins. I'm just an angel from who fell from he the <laughs> I can't. I'm just an angel who hell fell from the sky, darling. You try not to gag as the two of them flirt. You give a loud ahem and point Rex towards the construction yard. He looks back at Mars over his shoulder and winks as he leaves. Oh, who are you? You've seen Nomi Nomi around since the Heliopods landed. They're around your age and barely a meter and a half tall, only coming up to your shoulder. You've never seen anyone dress as strangely as they do. Hi! Their voice is high-pitched and quick. I'm Nomi Nomi! It's short for nomination! They do a little twirl and bow. You introduce yourself and... I want to know about your outfit. Oh, this old thing? I designed it myself. A Nomi Nomi original based on the outfit Lavendula Starlifter wears in the third season of Two Broke Girl Hyperjet Transform when she has to work undercover as a lead singer of an idol group. They stick their leg out. Oh, like I changed the bottom part and I, of course I have to wear my gaming gauntlets. I call them gaming gauntlets, but they're really Enviro suit gloves that I modded so I can play hollow games through them. Do you like games? My favorite, Laser Fable and Dig Dig Digger Dog. Laser Fable is so much more fun now that we can play outside with room to run around. What kind of hollow games do Strato Kids like to play? Nomi Nomi stops to catch their breath, a little extended after their outburst. I'm gonna challenge them to a game. I like Nomi Nomi. You're on! Nomi Nomi helps you install it on your holopom and explains the rules. Laser Fable is an augmented reality game where you bounce hologram lasers off real objects nearby. It's speed based, so you're running around and bumping into each other and our extended house rules about when it's legal to block each other's lasers. Alright, let's do it! Our first uh, interaction with one of the new people. I mean, we did talk to Rex, but Nomi Nomi, we're like actually interacting with them. Alright, that's pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. Let's see. Five. Three. Three, three? Ooh, that's really good. Let's see. F uh, five. Wait, five. Five. Oh, I'm gonna win either way. Heck yeah. Three, two, three, wait. Three, two, one? No! Three, two, one. Nice! Take that, Nomi Nomi. Fight on, friendo! Nomi gives you a high five with a couple of quick flicks on their gauntlet to give you kudos for winning. They explain how this is how they play away, always play Laser Fable with the kids from Heliosphere. Except they mostly don't want to play anymore. They say they're too old for it. They just want to be soldiers now. Except Rex. He's still cool. Alright, so Rex is cool, Nomi Nomi is cool, but I know there's a serious looking kid over here. 
The new boy from the Heliosphere is a couple years older than you. He's very handsome, and the missing arm gives him a heroic battle-scarred vibe. He stands tall and ready for action, even though it's a normal, boring day. The other recruits milling around the garrison give him a wide, respectful berth. He sees you staring and gives you a curt nod. My name is Vase, Lieutenant Olivacious, he says, considering you, considering you with a glint of a challenge in his eye. And you are? How do you introduce yourself? Um, I'm an explorer. His expression doesn't change. Is that right, he says, with the air of a boy who's hard to impress. Nice to meet you, Yabby. I hear it's been a rough couple of years for the colony. Lucky thing our heliopause came in just in time, he continues. Don't worry, we have some of the best soldiers. The very best. We'll keep the colony safe. That's a complete out lie. We were doing just fine before you came. Also, I don't believe you're going to keep this colony safe. We'll see when Glow shows up. Are you one of the best soldiers? We train as a team, but... Vase says, then clears his throat. Yes. I've won more than my share of zero-g judo matches and virtual rifle tournaments. Even competing against adults, he adds. Oh, uh, wow, you're pretty cool. <laughs> Just flirt immediately. Um... Being planet side is totally different. Mm. I don't think that he would be very accepting of me flirting with him. Like, not that he's like, I don't know. I just probably shouldn't be flirting with him during our first interaction. So I'm going to say being planet side is totally different. You tell Vase that firing a virtual gun is nothing compared to running for your life through the jungle while a wild Unisar hunts you down. A Unisar, Vase says, leaning forward a little. His eyebrows raised. Did you actually say something to interest him? That sounds like a fun sport. I'd like to try it sometime. Oh, dang. I didn't think my interaction with you was going to go that well. Okay, so we have the garrison. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so we have defense, sports ball, lookout training still. It's much larger and better supplied. All right. I still think I'm going to fucking bounce, but it's... All right, do we still have classes? Okay, we do. I really should get my toughness back up. I, I, I probably really need that. It's going to make challenges a lot harder. Alright, and what's up here? Supply Depot, I'm assuming? Yes. Um, what else have we got? Uh, oh, we've got uh, hydro the Geophonics. Alright. That's all well and good, but I think I'm going to go survey the plains. I really want to meet this person that everybody's been buzzing about. Okay, wait, where's the <laughs> where's the entrance? I'm all turned around. I mean, if Deese is over here, it's probably over here. Yep. Survey the plains. Nubby Nubby! <laughs> hey! Chief Surveyor Utopia stops you and Deese near the depot. Feel that? She asks. You can feel a kind of ominous, distant thumping, pulsing regularly through the ground. If you stand still, you can feel it vibrate up into your own body, too, like a massive global pulse. Hmm, Utopia says, checking a readout on her hollow palm. I reckon it's naturally occurring, she concludes, but it's giving me the willies all the same. You two better check it out. Mind you stick together and take readings on the way in case it's dangerous. You and Deese look at each other, excited. You follow the thumping, now an audible noise growing louder, west, until you've roughly triangulated its location. You know you're getting close, but it sounds like it's coming from all around you, and your instruments aren't precise enough to help. Let's follow the sound. I want to know what this is. Okay, five, four, three, five, plus two to all other cards. Okay, that could be good. Five, 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 zero. Ooh, that's really good. I'll take some minus stress, please. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, that's enough. Uh, five, four, three, two, one. Nope. Uh, one. There we go. Nice. All right, what did we find? Oh my goodness. You find a machine? An ancient, broken down machine. Like a small pyramid-shaped building made from some kind of dark stone or bone that looks almost like it grew that way. Except it isn't broken. It's just very old and overgrown. It looks more like a pile of rubble and roots than a building or engine or whatever it was. Still, a thumping noise comes from inside of it. The vibrations are strong here, making your guts feel weird. You don't notice it at first, but there's a curious path on the ground moving away from the machine. A line a, a half meter wide where the dirt is a little more worn and bare. 
It heads off in a straight line to the west, or coming from the west. Could animals have made this path? Or the thumper itself? Oh, dang it. Engineering. All right. Marvel at it. You run your hand- oh, it got me engineering- over its pitted, vibrating surface. How could something so unbelievably old still work? It's definitely not natural. You can even see something like writing carved into the not-quite-rock. Dees starts making oonts, oonts, oonts noises under his breath to the beat of the thumper. It's a pretty sick beat. Eventually, you head back to share your findings with Utopia. Totally an alien civilization, Dees insists. Utopia scratches her head. I suppose, maybe, she says. You said it looks ancient, right? Perhaps there could have been another Sith here long ago. We found other signs, but nothing active like this. Seems to be pointing west, or receiving something. She snaps her fingers. There's some right ugly ridge lines out there that kept us from checking the direction, but we got gliders and motivation. That's half the battle. She makes a note on her holopom. I'll open up the western bridges for surveyors, she says, then grins. Who say that three times fast. Dees is right, it's definitely aliens. Dees nods solemnly. It is aliens. I've met them before. They told me not to do something stupid and then I did it anyway. When you report for surveying duty, Nomi Nomi is here. It's their first day as a surveyor. They smile widely when they see you, smiling exuberantly. Oh, you two know each other already? Utopia says, looking at you, then Nomi Nomi. That'll make this easier. Yabby, yeah, I'd like you to keep an eye on Nomi while you're out there, Utopia continues. I'm going to assign you to the same regions for the next little while. Just make sure they don't wander into a nest of snap bladders, okay? Yay! <laughs> Nomi cheers and gives you a high five. As Utopia explains to Nomi Nomi and some other new Helio surveyors about the surveying tools, Nomi starts to get bored and wanders a little away from the group. You see it happening, but are powerless to stop them from tripping and nearly landing in a nest of Popeye eggs. They're just about to crash into the delicate <laughs> into the delicate spun glass cocoon when Utopia materializes as if out of nowhere and scruffs them by the back of the collar. Nomi, pay attention! Nomi giggles, like they don't even realize the danger of being stampeded by the upset Hoppies beginning to gather around. Utopia ushers them back to the group before things can get trampoly. Nomi asks a million questions about the eggs. Are they edible? Do they have hard shells or soft? What is the cocoon made out of? How long until they hatch? Utopia sighs. Just get out of here, you two, she says, before the cute little varmints turn ugly. <laughs> I like Nomi Nomi. They ask a lot of questions, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, especially when, with, with what we're dealing with. But I'm actually gonna dip right now, because I want to go to the ridge. I want to see what's going on. So let's go home. Nice. I do want to hang out with Nomi Nomi more, but I really want to figure out what's going on. And I can't do that if I'm stressed out, so we're gonna go out right away again. Actually, we should probably check and see if anyone wants to talk to us. Did anyone want to chat with me? Oh, an enemy, how are you doing? Nem. I've got something for you. Here you go. Egg for you. Talking weird. Okay, there's Tang. I probably should just stop running off into the areas that, like, I'm not supposed to go in. I probably should level myself up some more, but I really want to- I want to know what's going on. Alright, survey the ridge. I'm flying out, gliding out. Whoa! What the heckity heck is going on here? Oh, I should probably talk to you, huh? The only way to the resting ridges is by glider. Part vehicle, part kite, and all adrenaline. You land on the rocky, broken-up spine of the nearest ridge and nearly fall over when you look down at the plummeting slope into the basin below. You are a long way up. Decent Utopia gliding beside you. Whew! Utopia exclaims. You handled that glider like a champ, Dece. You too, Yaddy. She peers down over the slope of the ridge. A lot more exciting than the swamps, right? I want you two to stick together out there. It's dangerous in those ancient convergent domain ruins. Convergent ruins? You look around. The landscape is nothing like you've ever seen before. Dry, cracked soil gives way to steep cliffs, and what little vegetation here is brittle and sharp. You can feel the dry air wick away the moisture at your lips. Wait, what the heck is that? Oh. Flirt with Utopia. No, glowy thing on the ground. You point it out. Utopia gives it a nudge with her foot. Beats me, she says. You unearth the object. It's pulsing with light and warm to the touch. Hold up, Utopia says. Don't go picking things up, Yabby. Yeah, couldn't be radioactive, you know. Well, you're the one who kicked it. Utopia waves her hollow palm crystal over it and then checks in her interface. Hmm, only a little, she concludes. Whatever it is, it looks old, like thousands of years old. We've been digging up glowing gadgets all over this region, but got no clue what they're for. 
You hang on to that one. Maybe you'll figure it out. Oh, okay. And what is that? Crystal stuff way down below. Oh, those? Utopia says, pointing to the crystal formation so densely packed into the ravine that it looks like a sparkling river. More outcroppings of crystals decorate the slopes. They're all over the place. Be careful with them. Not sure if they're animal, vegetable, or mineral. She points off into the distance. There's a big island of them over there, like a glacier. Covers the whole damn place. Might be related to the convergent domain, but we ain't sure yet. Ah, okay. What about the stone structures? Well, there are buildings here, Utopia says. Traces of them anyway. Maybe 10, 20,000 years old? Sure didn't put them there. Dece lights up at the prospect of doing alien archaeology. We've checked them out, but not thoroughly. Mostly just trying to get a feel for who lived there and why they ain't here no more. Based on some glyphs, we are calling them the Convergent Domain. Whoever they were, they built these things to last, Utopia admires. And it ain't just arrowheads and cave paintings. There's real architecture. Machines, even. Wait, really? I wish I had more to tell you, Utopia says. Most everything we found just poses new questions. The structures read more organic than anything. So does that me mean their Gentech was super advanced? As for this place, we think it was some kind of solar network for them, she says, squinting up into the two suns. Looking at it from above, you can see these big mines traveling up and down the ridges like power lines. There's hardly any plant life elsewise, like they soaked up all the energy and made it a desert. But what they use that energy for, she says. If there was a civilization so big and so advanced on Vertumna, why can't we find more traces of it? Where are the cities? What are them thumpers for? And what happened to them all? She's right, that's a lot of questions. Maybe you can help find some answers. So anyway, those ruins are the main things we need to survey while you're out there, Utopia says. But keep an eye out for anything else weird. She claps dust off her hands. Well, my job here is done. You're all set, kid. Try to not fall off the cliff. Deese jumps back on his glider, too. As usual, he's going to scout on ahead and catch up with you later. Alright, Deese, I'll meet you there. <laughs> Ooh, I see flower. You're getting thirsty. You feel for your backup canteen, but it's missing. Somehow you lost it since you left this morning and you're all out of drinking water. The suns are high in the sky, making the ground waver and with heat haze mirages, your mouth feels dry, so dry and your head is starting to ache. You're pretty far from the outpost. You can make it back, but it, that'd be it for this expedition. You'd have to go home. Let's search for water. I have really high perception. Perception is like my highest skill. Would that be more or would that be more? Those are the same. I'm going to keep the five. Five, five, three, three. Oh, yeah, we got it. We're going to get some water. Don't worry, Yabby. Four, three, two, one. A straight, bitches. We got it, and we lost some stress. There's no natural water around, but in your search, you turn up your lost canteen. Wow, that was lucky. <laughs> Heck, yeah. Time passes. There's more flowers over here. I'll definitely take those. Alright, we've got two ways to go. Hmm. Let's see. The path ahead is blocked by a field of sneaking vines and brambles. They're flowering, enormous happy blossoms swaying in the shimmering heat waves. You push through them, but your hollow palm beeps a warning. A radiation warning! These flowers seem to be highly radioactive. Far too radioactive for the mild shielding your suit provides. You might be able to pass through if you don't mind feeling the offense of radiation sickness until you can detox at the med bed. Well, if it doesn't kill you outright, radiation is unpredictable. Let's just take a sample for now. Uh, and then let's turn around. We'll come back later. Let's see what's over here first. Hmm. The flies here are awful. They come out in the heat and day and buzz around you incessantly. They don't bite, but they seem to want something from you. Maybe the water or salt in your sweat? You hope they aren't laying eggs. Deese calls the most annoying ones rod flies because they're like long, flexible sticks with a bunch of wings. They swarm in clouds around your face no matter how hard you try to shoo them away. He says they remind him of Mars. But there are other ones too, like the one that's just a big eyeball with a couple pairs of wings. They make a loud buzzing sound and they're always just out of reach when you try to swat them away. Today your personal nemesis is one of these eye flies. There was a whole bunch of them earlier, but only one has persisted. It's been following you, staring at you all morning. You and Deese have been batting at it for an hour, but it's a fast dodger. Deese has finally given up and just plods forward. Even lands on his head and he doesn't care. I'll get it, Deese, don't worry. I have perception. Oh, six, five, four. That's really good. Nine. <laughs> Three. Or, oh wait. Um, wait. Should I save the nine? Three, two, 
two, two, nine, five, four, two, one. Nice. I'll get the fly. The eye fly is the size of a human eyeball and made of concentric rings of rainbow hues. Black, yellow, green, blue, and purple. You find yourself staring right back at it. You wonder if the rings have something to do with light refraction. You let it land on your arm, then you strike! Ha! Got it! Squashed! Ten minutes later, there's a new fly following you. Oh, God damn it! That wasn't worth it. <laughs> Ooh! Hmm. You come across a particularly flat area, a large field of obsidian. Well, obsidian is the only word you have for it, but you've never seen obsidian this bright. It's like a rainbow strapped underneath its glossy black surface, like the entire ground here is polished black opal. The field glints at a certain angles, momentarily blinding you. It looks slippery and shiny. Skate on through it! I'm gonna be brave today! Oh god, maybe I shouldn't have been. Six, three, uh, three, five, four, four, three, uh, five, four, three, three, two. There we go. We've got a good amount of cards now. If only I could have used those during the famine. You take off your shoes and glide around on your sock feet. You take a tumble and get a little bruised. But you have a blast. Woo! Do some science while you're here. You find a patch that is a little different and take some readings. You confirm the material is not natural. It must have been created by the Convergent Domain because it's the same stuff they made the thumpers out of. Silica mixed with some trace of organic elements. By looking at stratations <laughs> in the cliff nearby, you determine that this entire region used to be covered in a thick sheet of this dark glass rock. In most places, there's now a layer of soil over it, but if you dig down far enough, you'll probably find this layer everywhere. Like, the whole place has been glassed. No wonder there are so few plants here. The convergent domain must have paved this area to discourage plant life from growing. All except for the crystals, which seem to sprout happily from the obsidian pavement. Interesting. Oh. Does this take me back around? Oh, cool. I didn't have to go through the radiation flowers. Heck yeah. Hmm. There's a strange heat haze shimmer across the path ahead. Oddly, it doesn't clear up as you get closer. The mirage effect is very strong. The refracted air makes it look like there's a pool of water on the ground and plants waving around it. But something is just off about the illusion. You can't put your finger on why. I'm so glad I have such high perception. Like, I know I've kind of been screwed by the fact I don't have other stuff, but like, my perception is so high. <laughs> I'm able to do all these challenges and I'm very happy about it. Five, four, four, three, three. Yeah! The faster you move, the faster the mirage disappears. You approach cautiously. You, As you do, you realize what is wrong about the mirage. It's impossible. The plants on either side of the haze are different. Not just wibbly-wobbly from layers of air, but bigger, older. And it's a different time of day. Evening, not morning. Then you see them. It's you! Through the heat haze, you see yourself in the distance, walking towards you. You move to the edge of the mirage and peek around it, but they aren't there. You can only see them through the heat haze. Like some kind of doorway. A mirror. Call out! You shout, hey, you! Wave your arms and jump up and down. The figure looks at you curiously. You! It's definitely 100% you! Staring back at you like a mirror. Your movement seems to disturb the mirage, which breaks up and fades before you. Behind it is a regular morning, and you're now alone again. Weird. What the heck? Alright, we can go that way, or we can keep going this way. Picked up the flower. Okay. I want to see if there might be anything interesting over here. I'm going to keep going this way. The sun goes behind a cloud and you feel a light splattering of rain. It sizzles into the dry hot ground around you, providing a little relief from the heat of the day. Then you realize you don't see a single cloud in the sky ahead of you, and it almost never rains in the western ridges. The plants here rely on nighttime dew for moisture. Uh, run! You bolt for cover with your hands thrown over your head. You don't even care what's up here, you just know that that was no rain. That probably wasn't good. Maybe I just got peed on. I mean, I've seen other animals pee. Oh! It's the thing! You find your way blocked by a massive wall. No, a hollow pillar. Knocked over and lying on its side in the sand. It's absolutely massive. It stretches to your left and right at least a kilometer in each direction. 
though at some points it's crumbled enough that you could likely scale over it. Let's check it out. Hmm, okay, 69. Nice. Five, five, one. Oh, that's not good. Can I draw a card? Redraw hand. That's a little better. Four, four, three. Oh, way better. Escaping the Shimmer Glade. Um, three, three, two, one. All right, nine, five, five, two, zero. Ooh, yes. Ooh, that was a little close though. No skill changes. Deese looks giddy as you follow the pillar to its base, a large pyramid almost entirely lost under the sand. You brush away some of the sand and find that the pyramid is inscribed on all sides with pictures of, well, wormholes, you think. This pillar must have once stretched up into the sky. Maybe it was some kind of observatory, or sacred building, or just a monument to the wormhole. Mysterious. Huh. There's gotta be something at the end of all this, right? What's the- hmm. We can go this way, or we can go over here. Oh, there's a- oh, I thought that was an exclamation point. Huh. Oh, there's another thing! Hmm. Well, we need to pick carefully now because we're running out of energy, and we'll have to probably come back next time. Let's see. Hmm. Which way to go? Hmm. Can I go this way? No. Let's go this way. Utopia sent you and Deese to study one of the large crystal outcroppings. Up close, you can't help but get a sense that they're alive somehow. They're angular and hard to the touch, but they have a sort of sponginess and warmth to them that's a little disconcerting. They emit a humming noise. Deese pokes one with his finger. Weird. It's almost like they're breathing. Well, let's study them. I mean, it's like I have the perception already, so... Oh my goodness! All right, that was- oh my goodness! Oh, okay, it took a second to change. I thought it was still, like, really bad. Okay, three plus two in the- f if in the first or last panel. Four. Four- oh, wait. Three- <laughs> Come on, change- okay. Plus two to card. Three. Hmm. Uh, three? Yay! <laughs> that was a little close. You notice the, that they hum the loudest at midday, under full sun. The few crystals that have grown under shaded outcroppings are less vibrant than the others. They look kind of like convergent domain tech, don't they? Dee says. Like the organic obsidian or the crystals embedded in the ruins. Let's try blocking the sun. On a hunch, you cover up one of, with some ferns, and after an hour... It stops vibrating. It's something deep inside of it has gone dormant. The crystal turns clear, like the ones that were shadowed naturally. When you remove the fronds, its color returns. Oh, so it's like photosynthesis, Dees exclaims, but it, it's not a plant, right? Let's try uprooting one. They do indeed have roots, and they're really tough. You dig around the base of, of one and expose them so you can see. They're made of the same glass, but rough and frosted, and warm, much warmer than the surrounding soil. The roots go deeper than you can dig. You won't be able to remove one without breaking it. Should we break one? Break it. You wiggle one of the crystals like a loose tooth. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Boom! Oh no. You're thrown off by an explosion. When the dust settles, you brush off the shards of a warm crystal. You realize that some of the nearby crystals have also exploded. Are they connected underground? Yes! I know a micro... Uh, a micro... A micro... Mycor Heisel Network, when I see one, Dees exclaims. They're alive, like fungus, but also kind of artificial, like the convergent domain's buildings. I bet they were used to harvest energy from sunlight, like living solar panels. I wonder if they've been growing wild this whole time, or if they still power something. He stops. Wait, are you okay, Yabby? You dust yourself off and scribble excitedly in your survey notes. This is an important scientific discovery. All right. Well, that was pretty good. We're pretty worn out, but... We got a lot done. We got some engineering, too. We're definitely gonna have to go back there. There's definitely something hiding out there, isn't there? Would you like 
A strange device. Would you like a flower? Oh, never mind. I'm sorry. I just want to be friends. Would you like a flower? Would you like a flower or a crystal? Hey, Nomi Nomi makes a sound of appreciation and holds the crystal up to the light. Wow, it makes rainbows? It's perfect, thanks so much. I like these new people. They're a little confusing to figure out, but I like them. All right, what if we relax in the lounge? Ah. Let's see, the old lounge is toast. What was left over from the attack last glow was destroyed in the crash. The new lounge just isn't the same. You miss the beanbags and walls covered with art you scrawled as kids. Someday this place will feel like the heart of the colony again, but right now it just reminds you of how chaotic and horrible the past year has been. Goodness, so much has happened. I didn't even think about that. Hmm, let's keep these. Oh, I got friendship with Rex from relaxing. All right, well, these past two episodes have definitely been a doozy. Hopefully things will start cooling down, but we're definitely gonna keep searching. We gotta try and find whoever that is. There's somebody out there, I know there is, and we're gonna find them if we can. But until then, thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, please consider subscribing. Remember to take care of yourselves, watch out for falling spaceships, and have a good day.